In the shadows of the criminal justice system, some cases cast a chilling shroud over even the most seasoned defenders of the law. On this episode of Gold Shields, we will delve into Karen Conti's daunting task, defending John Wayne Gacy, the embodiment of evil. As Gacy's appeal for the death penalty loomed, Karen navigated a web of darkness, confronting his incomprehensible depravity. Join us as we explore Karen's relentless pursuit of justice in the face of unspeakable horror. Join us on this chilling episode of Gold Shields. Gold Shields brings true stories from law enforcement, the military, true crime authors, and first responders. Experience the dedication, danger, and emotional toll with the heroes themselves. These gripping tales of true crimes, true stories, and true heroes are all here on Gold Shields. Hey, it's Dan back at Gold Shields with my partner in crime, Tom Smith. How are you doing this morning, buddy? Good, pal. Good, pal. Really looking forward to this episode, which uh, is a little different than what we normally do. It's going to be cool. Yeah, you know, there's different perspectives to cases. We, we've had a, a writer on who, who we spent some time with and wrote a book, kind of a second party to the um, Jeffrey Dahmer case, who was interesting. There's different angles to cases. And today we happen to be very privileged to have an amazing woman on whose story is probably going to rock you, even though you think you know the story. We love giving the, the, this side of the story, the backstory that people don't always get. But Tom, tell us who we have this morning. You know what? I'm going to start it <clears throat> this way, that no matter what goes on in the criminal justice system, every person convicted or whatever has the right to uh, their constitutional rights, no matter who it is. And today we're going to talk about probably the most infamous, famous, however you want to categorize it, serial killer of all time. And what is even allotted to him constitutionally with his defense attorney, Karen Conti, which we are so thrilled to have because this is a fascinating concept and avenue and angle of uh, an extremely famous case. So Karen, welcome to Gold Shields and thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, well, you are a, a, a well-respected defense attorney counsel in the Chicagoland area. And you happen to, did you grow up in Chicago? Tell us a little bit about that. I grew up in the su one suburb over of Chicago, a very blue collar neighborhood, but I've been around Chicago my whole life. I went to college in a town not too far from Chicago and law school at University of Illinois, a little farther south. And so, but I've lived and worked in the Chicago area for the last 35, 40 years. So, Tell us about your career. Where did you start? Were you clerking for somebody? Did you go right into defense work? How did that happen? I started out at a big law firm. Uh, I had a lot of student loans, and I'd put myself through college and law school, so I wanted to pay those off. So I worked for a large, prestigious firm. I hated that, really hated that, <laughs> representing insurance companies and denying coverage to unsuspecting policyholders. Uh, didn't really get me up in the morning. So I went to another firm, did similar types of things, and I really didn't like that either. Um, so I ended up doing some work for a fitness company um, on my own, and I was trying to branch out and maybe not practice law anymore when I met a man named Greg Adamski, who would become my law partner for many years and later my husband. And we started practicing law together. He, he did all kinds of work, criminal, civil, uh, white, blue collar crime. And we tried cases across the country. I became a California lawyer. And uh, we had a very, very, very exciting practice that was diversified and we took on free work when we wanted to do that. Uh, and it was, it was just the ride of a lifetime. So you, uh, how, now how did that bring you to the point where you are counsel for Mr. John Wayne Gacy? And I love how they use three names. I wonder if anybody ever called him John Gacy during his life, because once he becomes a serial killer, it's mandatory you give him the three names, right? H how did it come to be that you met him and got involved in his case like you did? Well, your listeners should know that when he was committing his crimes, I was in high school. And I remember, I think I was a senior in high school when he was caught and he was later convicted and sentenced to death. He was the world record serial killer at the time, 33 young men and boys, most of them buried under his home. So flash ahead 14 years, 
I'm driving down the road with my law partner, and I hear on the radio that John Gacy is set to be executed on May 10th, 1994. And I said to myself, oh, my gosh, he's been sitting on death row all these years while I've been going to college and law school, and now I've been out of law school six years. And I said, We're, you know, Illinois has not executed somebody in a long time. I mean, is this really going to happen? And I said, boy, John must really be really having a hard time with this as if, you know, I was on a first name basis with him. <laughs> a few days later, I was. So we get the call to represent Gacy, not in his criminal matter, but rather in a civil matter. The prison was suing him on a First Amendment issue. So uh, my partner and I had argued before the U.S. Supreme Court on a First Amendment case. So we were on the list of First Amendment lawyers. And, you know, I had no intention of representing him in a civil matter or any matter, as a, you know, to that end. So but I wanted to meet the epitome of evil. I wanted I was so curious. I wanted to go on death row. I wanted to see what that was like. And I wanted to look at this household word. When you grow up in Chicago, he's the boogeyman. No, he, he is the boogeyman. And um, so we made the trip six and a half hours south of Chicago, and we met the uh, poster child for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. You know what's so interesting? And then the first thing that came to my mind when I was reading the excerpt of your book was you titled it The Call. And the one thing that I came up with was as a detective, similar to a lawyer, you want that case. You know, you always dream of it. You always like wonder when that big case is going to get presented to you and thrown to you. And that day or afterwards, you know, the call was that case. And and it's great how you thought it started or you were under the impression it was starting one way and then take us through, you know, like you were just alluding to getting there and actually having probably the most evil person on planet Earth sitting in front of you. That's got to be whether you're a defense attorney, a prosecutor, a detective or whatever, that's a little chilling, is it? Well, it is. And, you know, I don't know if I was just naive or, you know, or ambitious or, or what it was, but I think curiosity just drove me because you always want to know, you know, and I've always been one of these serial killer aficionados, right? And Jack the Ripper and, and Lizzie Borden. And I knew all those, all, all those stories when I was growing up. Um, but I, I, I was just curious. And, um, but, but truthfully, you know, I don't believe in the death penalty. I've never believed in the death penalty. I, I, I'm not here to preach about that. But, but when you are handed the opportunity to take on a high profile case like this and to stand up against, you know, you're really kind of representing a cause in addition to representing your defendant. And I thought this was a really, this was a challenge to say the least. Uh, and I could do this in a public way that I might be able to help the cause. That, that didn't happen. I don't think I moved the needle. Um, or, sorry for the pun on that one. Um, but, but I do believe that um, it, was, it was an opportunity for me to stand up against something that I think is unfair in, in our country. So what was his First Amendment issue? In Illinois, there's a law that says that if you as an inmate can afford your incarceration, you have to pay and the state can sue you for that. Well, Gacy was doing all these horrible paintings in his cell and he was making money, not a lot of money, but he was making some money. And so uh, he wanted to defend that case and he was going to say it was his First Amendment right to earn money and that this was just an end run to, to like basically stop his First Amendment rights. So um, it was irrelevant. He was going to die in seven months. Why do you care about your money? But he wanted, you know, Gacy was very oppositional and he was defiant about things. And he actually said to me, well, why don't we just say, if you want me to pay rent, I'll just be evicted. So that was that was his answer, <laughs> that was his answer to the problem. So we, we resolved that problem for him. We settled that matter. And uh, but what we really wanted to do was represent him in the death penalty aspect. And we did. So, you know, everyone has a preconceived because of the movies, because of TV, what someone like him is like. You know, like you just said, the boogeyman, you know, the boogeyman is is Michael Myers. The boogeyman is the unknown of of Jack the Ripper. Were you surprised by his personality or was it a surprise or was it what you thought? You know, like I said before, having him in front of you is is something that, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the world is never going to encounter. How was that sitting in front of you? Was he what you thought? 
Well, because I had read so much about him, uh, and I, I, I'm very interested in the psychology of serial killers, I knew that I wasn't going to see the tattoo of evil on his head, you know. Uh, but it was shocking how normal he was. He was small. He was unimposing. He was about five foot nine. He was very pale from all the prison years. You know, you, you don't really it's not a trip to the spa when you're doing time on death row. And he just looked like somebody who couldn't possibly have committed these crimes. He was engaging, glib. Uh, he was funny. He was he was gentlemanly with me. Uh, and he, you know, was I will tell you this. He was compartmentalized. Obviously, he he lived a life for the most part that was very moral. He went to church. He was nice to his family. He supported community. He volunteered. He, he mowed the lawn for his neighbors for years. He threw parties. Everyone liked him. So here he was doing all these good things. And then he would go out at night and do some of the most unspeakable crimes in, in history, right? So so what I got with him was the former. I got the good Gacy. I got the affable Gacy. I knew he was capable of that other side, but I never saw that because I wasn't his type and he wasn't going to do it to me because he needed me. So it's surprising to see that. You know it in your head that that's going to be like that, but it, it's still surprising and chilling that there may be other people out there who you're dealing with who are capable of those things and you just don't know it. You know, as a cop and detective, you meet all types of people and you, you tend to hang out with the criminal types. That's what you're looking for. So you look for them, you find them, you arrest them, you spend time with them. And there are people who do bad things and, and they have um, a way about them that you just know this person is looking to steal or he's looking to rob or he's looking to rape. They have that feel. And then you have pure sociopaths who are, as you said, compartmentalizing. They're able to be two different people or three different people, whatever they need to be. Um, did he ever discuss anything with you or I know there's a lot of tapes of his discussion, his urges to do this, was it, was it an over, overarching urge in his life to do these sort of things or was it situational and he was taking advantage of it for sexual, uh, uh, gratification and then just burying the evidence, so to speak, because I think there's many different ways a serial killers approach what they do. I'm just curious if you had any of those discussions or what you learned about that about him. Uh, Gacy confessed to the crimes to his first lawyer when then again when I was in high school, and he had a really almost um, photographic memory of where he picked these boys up, some of their names. He knew where they were buried in his uh, basement, his crawl space. He drew a map for the police about it. There was some sense of relief, I think, that he was finally caught because it was escalating, and it was very stressful. For him, you know, to say that, you know, to, to go out and hunt for, for young men and boys and kill them and bury them. Um, but when it came to time for me to step in, he was denying that he did any of it. So he had changed his tune and I would ask him questions to try to get those answers that you just asked me. And I he never he never talked about it. But reading between the lines and reading the psychiatric reports over the years, I will tell you that Gacy had a compulsion to do this. Uh, one of psychiatrists said that if Gacy was taken out of jail and he, and, and he was given the opportunity to kill a young man and there were policemen standing right there, it wouldn't matter to him. He would just do it because it was such a strong urge for him. Um, and I think prison took that out, took that stress and that uh, possibility out of the equation. So he lived a more institutionalized life that was calmer. And actually, I think it was he liked it. He actually liked being in prison because he didn't have those urges. Not that he was uh, remorseful about any of it, but because he wasn't. And w whenever he got an opportunity, he would say things like, well, what were those boys doing at the Greyhound bus station at night anyway? So you could see that he dehumanized them and he had no regard for their lives. So. I hope that answers your question. He he never yeah. really, you know, engage, engage in that conversation with me because he wasn't self-reflective by the time I, I started dealing with him. That's very interesting because there are a number of serial killers who have gone on the record after the fact that, and almost bragged about what they've done. They, they're proud of it. They're proud of how they got away with it for so long. They see themselves um, much smarter than their adversaries, the police. And, well, uh, he 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 did think he knew better than everyone else. Always the smartest guy in the room. Definitely that. 
Um, but I did have a conversation with him once and I was just I used to just kid him. I said, you know, hey, this guy named Henry Lee Lucas, you know, he's got three names, too. Like that guy's got over 200 murders like attached to him. And Bush just commuted a sentence and blah, blah, blah. And, and I and he Gacy got angry. He's like, that guy didn't kill that many. I said, how do you know? What, like, what do you have, like a serial killer, like club that you join? And he's like, <laughs> that guy, they just wanted to close cases. And so they all just threw a bunch of murders together and they then they made him confess to all of them. So I could see that exact thing. He was proud that he was a record holder and he didn't want anybody to beat him. He did say that to me, but read between the lines. And that's exactly what he was saying. That's fascinating. <clears throat> and, and you know what? It, it goes kind of to the point, uh, and you said it before, you know, serial killers, you've heard this before, you know, they're not famous unless they get caught. You know, they, they're not. And then they have the ability to do exactly what he said. No, I'm better. I mean, it's like a high school kid. You know, who scored more points in a basketball game? No, I did. No, I did. Uh, no, he didn't play a good a team as I did, and I scored more. It's bizarre, but it's so fascinating. Uh, so what I wanted to get to now, so what happens? Like how you get there, you're a young lawyer still, you know, uh, dealing with this. What happens with the case? What When does the, the First Amendment thing switch to... Uh, what inevitably becomes the appeal for his death sentence. Well, almost immediately, we said to Gacy, listen, uh, we'll, we'll handle your civil matter. We'll resolve it. I mean, the, the, you know, it, all we had to do is say we need a continuance of the execution to finish the civil case. And basically, the, the, the prison system said, OK, we'll settle it because <laughs> we want you dead more than we want your money. So but we said, Gacy, we're not doing that until we get on your death team, because my partner and I both were against the death penalty, and we wanted to be on that important cause, not the in, in, unimportant cause. So at that point in time, all traditional appeals have been exhausted, and a person on death row gets a lot of appeals, and it's not because of liberal lawyers. It's because of conservative judges and legislators who know that mistakes get made. And so there's cases that go up in the state and cases that go up in the federal, and it goes back down, and then there are all these different avenues to attack the the conviction and the sentence. So by that time, all of those appeals were done. So now we were just on a Hail Mary. And, you know, we would, were attacking the execution. We're saying that the lethal injection is cruel and unusual because the machine was invented by somebody who didn't know what he was doing and, it, and it's going to clog and it's going to torture him to death, which it did, uh, as we predicted. Most people didn't care about that, but that was one of our arguments. So we had all these traditional, um, uh, untraditional appeals that we were throwing in the fire and um, spoiler alert, uh, none of them really worked. Yeah, his history will tell you that. But So you mentioned earlier, just to flip back for a second, you had always wanted to go on death row to see what that was like. You had a, a curiosity about that. You had a chance to do that. Tell us about that. Well, you know, when I, I had been to prisons before, many of them, uh, and when you go to prisons to visit prisoners, you know, they're usually in the middle of the, the state. So, you know, you're driving three hours in the middle of nowhere and you see these farms and then there's this big prison. So, I mean, I had been through that before. And, you know, it's it's not it's they're not safe places. But generally speaking, because you're a lawyer, uh, the prisoners aren't going to attack you because they need you. They want you. They want your phone number. They want, you know, can you send me some case law? Can you send me? Can you help me? So um, when I went to Menard, you know, we're far south. We're like on the same latitude as Memphis, Tennessee. So that's how far south we are. And we're in this prison that's old and it just looks like something out of a Stephen King novel. And it's disgusting. It's, it's old. <clears throat> and we weave our way through all these little nooks and crannies and we finally get to death row. And I thought there was going to be that little cubicle with the plexiglass that you see in the movies. And that wasn't the way it was at all. So the the death row at the time was you went into this bullpen, you were locked, <clears throat> you were locked into this bullpen with all of the all of the death row people with their ministers, their girlfriends, their lawyers. And as a lawyer, you kind of know who the people on death row are. Like, there's the I-57 killer. There's the guy who poisoned his whole family. Oh, there's the guy who eats body parts. And so you're going like, oh, my gosh, here are like the the who's who among evil all roaming around free range and, and and Gacy probably is the least scary of them. So 
that that was a little daunting because, you know, I knew Gacy wasn't going to attack me. But the other people, they were, you know, some of them were psychotic and unmedicated. Bad combination with nothing to lose, too. What a that is a great question, Dan, by the way. I know you're my partner and don't do that was an awesome question because so many people don't know. You hear the term, you know what it is, you know, but you don't really get an inside look at that because it's it's not a thing. You, you never see the inside of, of what goes on in there. And you know what? A question just popped into my head, which I think a lot of people that are going to be watching this show, and it's an understanding, I, I think it's a fair question. I already know the answer to it, I think. But I think a lot of people want us to ask you, how do you do it? How do you, how do you defend, not defend, how do you represent that much evil? You know, do you just kind of take a step back and, hey, it's my job. And it doesn't matter who he is. It doesn't matter what he did. I have a responsibility to defend his constitutional rights. And that's just the way I'm going to do it. Is that what you go through? Lady Law Shield, led by Bridget Truxillo, stands as a formidable ally for law enforcement officers facing the daily challenges of discrimination, intimidation, and harassment in the workplace. Founded by Bridget, a former Florida deputy sheriff, who defied the odds to ascend from an undercover narcotics detective to a SWAT team operator. Her firm understands the unique struggles and complexities of law enforcement careers. With a deep-rooted commitment to defending the rights of those who protect and serve, Lady Law Shield specializes in employment-related matters tailored specifically for law enforcement and first responders. Whether battling unjust treatment, advocating for fair treatment, or navigating complex legal issues, they are steadfast in their mission to empower and protect those who dedicate their lives to public safety. Trust Bridget Trixillo and Lady Law Shield to be your unwavering advocate in the pursuit of justice and fairness in the workplace. Go to LadyLawShield.com to contact Bridget and have her in your corner. That's LadyLawShield.com. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean... There's a lot to unpack here. <clears throat> Everyone's entitled to a defense, of course. And a lot was at stake here because it wasn't just Gacy's life. It was other people on death row who might have really good arguments like actual innocence. Gacy had not, you know, had not did not have that argument. It could be racist prosecution, which Gacy did not have that. And it could be incompetent counsel, which was also not Gacy's case because he had good lawyers throughout. So um, but you're advocating for a cause. And and I always tell people two things. One is if a person walks into an ER room and he's 200 pounds overweight and he's smoking cigarettes and he's eating Twinkies and he's just lived a horrible life, the doctor doesn't say, you know what, you, you just didn't do a good job with your life. I'm really not going to treat you when you're having a heart attack. No, the doctor takes him as he is with his bad conduct and his bad health and <clears throat> tries to save his life um, or make him better, whatever. That's what we do. So we, I don't take just innocent people. I just say, oh, I want the innocent ones to come to me. I represent people in all walks of life, people who beat their children, beat people who I, I've represented companies that make asbestos. I've represented some really bad companies and dudes and women uh, who embezzle from churches. I, so I, what I do is I look at each case and I figure out how do I best represent that person? How do I make the government prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that person is guilty of that crime and not some other crime. And if I do my job, the police do a good job gathering evidence, the prosecution is zealous, the judge is impartial, the jurors follow their jury instructions. If all of us do our jobs, justice usually gets done. You know, I don't make the justice. I, I, that's not my job as a defense lawyer. I'm just a, a cog in this wheel of justice. And I think it's an important part because if I don't get it right, if I don't make the government proved that he killed all those boys and men, then someone's out there who did. And we can talk about this a little later. And it's in my book, Gacy didn't kill all these boys. I, I'm quite convinced of that. And so there are, is probably someone out there who is capable of doing that again. You, you bring up great points. You know, as a working detective over time, you really begin to appreciate the sanctity of the system, so to speak, if you want to call it that, we want our system to be as pure as possible. It's a system run by human beings, inhabited by human beings, and we're going to make mistakes. 
But I think Tom and I can speak for the vast, vast majority of anyone who's ever investigated a case and arrested somebody and gone through, through the prosecution as an arresting officer. We want to see the right person get caught for the crime. And we want to see them get their day in court. And we want to see our evidence stand up and, and all that other good stuff. And if you lose a trial, for whatever reason, you should learn from it. Um, everybody deserves that right to counsel. It's either the old joke, uh, all lawyers are horrible people except mine. Mine's the best, right? Uh, but they do deserve robust counsel. And I have seen very good defense counsel um, coming at me uh, on a stand and fine, come at me. And if I'm good at what I do, I'm ready for it. And I've got answers to the questions and I've hopefully laid them out during my, my opening comments, my, um, my direct as opposed to waiting for you to find it and, and aha me, you know? So we, we respect what defense counsel does. And if you're an American, you have to respect this process. And, but we also know that defense counsel, sometimes they get a bad name. How, and you know, it maybe call it the uneducated response or how could you, how could you represent that person? They have every right as you do, because you could be wrongly accused or you can be accused and you still have to make sure the government does its job. So we, I, I've always said I would rather have never put anybody in prison based upon a case I did ever than put the wrong person in for the rest of their life who didn't do it. That's, that's a travesty I couldn't live with. And, and you know what's, what's interesting, too, is that in a death penalty case, the chances of wrongful conviction are much higher. Why? Because when you have horrendous crimes, multiple victims, children, abuse, sadistic practices, that those jurors are sitting there hearing this stuff that's so horrible that they can't unsee it and unhear it. They're, they're traumatized by it. And there's only one person sitting in that defendant's chair and they're saying to themselves, if there's any chance that that person, you know, did it, I, I got to convict him. And even though it's beyond a reasonable doubt, I think jurors get it wrong because of the horrendous nature of the crimes. And I'm not disparaging jurors because jurors do a great job in this country. I have a lot of respect for jurors. But um, and you've seen that in Illinois, we had 12 in a period of about 15 years. We had 12 men walk off of death row, not on a technicality because of actual innocence. And 12 were put to death, 12 and 12. So we had a Republican governor at the time. He was very conservative. He'd always been in favor of the death penalty. And he said, I can't do this anymore. I'm commuting all the sentences and I'm going to put a moratorium on the death penalty. Because when you see that kind of those mistakes being made, that's. That's deadly, literally. And defense attorneys, you know, and we, we discussed this on a show. When, when people say, like I just said to you before, you know, how do you do that? Well, you know what? Any of us can need a defense attorney in a blink of an eye. <laughs> and you want a talented person who's going to defend you, who's going to fight for you, who's going to do everything under the sun to make sure you know, the evidence is done the right way. Statements are done the right way and all that. So it's very easy. And that's actually why I asked you that, because I wanted this follow up to say, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, defense attorneys are this, like Danny just said, you know, but at any point, especially a cop, you know, you could need a defense attorney, you know, in, in a minute. Uh, and you want the most talented person who is totally dedicated to their job and dedicated to the Constitution and the rights of others. And I give you a lot of credit. I, I really do, because I don't think, you know, defense attorneys get enough credit. You know, did we have to go, you know, head, you know, head on with them at trials? Yeah. But you know what? We said this one other time. I always I, I had respect for defense attorneys, especially the ones who after the trial or whatever, would go up to you in the lobby and shake your hand and go, you know, detective, great job. Good job. I almost had you like and then you'd start kind of I almost had you. I almost had you and I thought I had, you know, and then you realize there's a human part of this and there's a skill set and there's a job to do on both ends. And uh, I think where you went with this was just uh, an incredible experience for you. You know, and another part of it is that I and I hear this a lot. What about the victim? Don't you care about the victims? Well, you know, of course I care about the victim. Of course. I, I can't imagine the suffering that they continue. And I even knew that by writing this book all these years later that this was going to open up some wounds for people. And that was one of the reasons I waited so long because I, I didn't really want to go there. But I will tell you this, you know, I represent victims all the time. I represent victims of domestic violence. I represented, I talk about in my book, um, 
a family of a little girl who was sexually abused by a high profile neighbor. They ref- uh, the government refused to prosecute him and they hired me to try to get uh, a prosecution, which I did. And so I was advocating to put this guy in jail. So I'm, I'm, I represent whoever I'm representing. I'm doing it zealously, zealously without regard for the rights of somebody else. So, um, you know, which it's hard for people to understand because they want you to play on one team or the other. But that's not really what we do. We, we, we just take each person who comes into our office, figure out what's the best strategy to get them the best result possible, and then we execute on it. So we did a very poor job, and you did a great job of segueing to your book. <laughs> Tell us about your book. Uh, you waited a long time to write it, um, and you just gave a little bit of a hint earlier as to you don't believe that Gacy killed all the victims that are associated with him. Expand on that if you don't mind. So my book is about that seven months that I represented Gacy, but I think that's the draw. Of course, no one's going to buy a book because they don't know who I am, but Gacy will be the draw. But the book is really about my dealing with this high profile, terrible public backlash case that changed my life. It changed my life professionally and personally. Uh, It changed the way I thought about things, about how I practice law. And it's sort of a lesson, or I want it to be a lesson, in how you can be curious and, and, and do something just out of curiosity and how that can lead you to an opportunity and that you take that opportunity and you do the best job you can. You get prepared for it. You do it with dignity. You do it with grace. You do it with precision. And whatever the result is, you're now a more resilient person. You're a more confident person. And it leads to doors being opened to you. And I think everyone has had that pivotal moment. You know, whether it's an illness in the family or some adverse thing that's happened to you, you get stronger, you become more resilient. And so my book is sort of about that self-discovery and how I had little hurdles along the way. As a woman, I wasn't treated very well in many aspects of my career uh, all those years ago. And so how I've kind of overcome those things and how this case really did make me stronger in dealing with those kinds of issues. So so the book is about Gacy. It's about conversations that I had with him about me trying to figure out his psychology, about the stress in, involved in the, in the case. Uh, and, and But it's also about the human aspect of all of these things. What is it like to be talking to someone who's a human being who has committed inhumane acts? What's it like to say goodbye to somebody who we know is going to be executed? Um, and so all of those things now all the, the the hindsight, I can look at that in a better way than I could have at the time, and with a little wisdom, uh, I think I try to try to explain some of those things in a little better way than I than I could have before. Unbelievable, uh, and it's called "Killing Time with John Wayne Gacy," which is a absolute epic title. <laughs> you know, we couldn't think of, think of a name of the book. And my publisher wanted one thing. My book agent wanted another thing. I literally woke up in the middle of the night with that. I was dreaming of that title. Isn't that really? Weird? Okay. <laughs> Talk about jumping off the page. That's great. Or Coffee <laughs> with the Killer Clown was another one that was on the table, I know, right? Uh, Hanging with John. Um, I had not, out, of, out of the Crawl Space was up there for a while. Oh, <laughs> wow. That too. Wow. That's Bury my one. heart under John Wayne Gacy's. <laughs> Porch, yeah. There's a million potential. We, we go on all day with jokes yeah, it's about better it. better with, uh, with a glass of wine in your hand when you do those <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> For sure. We'll have to do that at some point. But uh, So you are also a radio personality in addition to your legal career. And uh, tell us about everything you're involved in. Our audience is going to want to know more about you, how they can hear from you, how they can maybe get in touch with you. You're a fascinating person. I can't wait to read your book. I'm going to get a signed copy from you, you promised, right? Right. Remember? Absolutely. We had that conversation. No, we didn't. <laughs> we'll send you. We'll send you some Gold Shield show swag and some impact stuff, and we'll uh, we'll call it even. But I'm looking forward to reading the book. I can't wait to read it. Um. Well, I, I, I'm going to talk about myself in, and I'm going to tie it to how Gacy was responsible for a lot of these things. So, so when Gacy was executed about 30 days later, O.J. Simpson took his drive on the white Bronco after allegedly killing his um, former wife and her friend, and so. All of a sudden, because I had been doing interviews uh, nationally and internationally, all of a sudden people said, hey, can you talk about OJ? You're, you know, you're good on the air or whatever. So I became a legal analyst on the local 
station in Chicago and then I did CNN and Fox News. And so I, I became, you know, I, I just did a national news today uh, uh, last week on O.J. Simpson's death. So all of these things happened because of my association with Gacy. I was offered a radio show in Chicago and for 30 years I've hosted radio shows in a top market. Um, I, my dean of my law school, a prestigious law school, came to me and said, would you like to be a professor and teach the death penalty? I said, I took one case that was a death penalty case and I lost it. I said, that's like <laughs> asking the, the captain of the Exxon Valdez to teach boating safety, right? So <laughs> when I took that, I took it and I became a professor and I have taught law school for 25 years, which I've really enjoyed, but it's also been very good for my career. Again, Clients come to me sometimes saying, I know you represented Gacy, and man, if you represented that scumball in the way you did, I, I'm a nice person. You're going to really represent me. So, <laughs> um, so all of these things have been good for my career, and it's hard to tag it that Gacy was responsible, but I think the opportunity that the case opened to me helped me achieve some of those things. So, um, and so, so for people who want to know more about me, you can go to karenconti.com. You can go to WGN Radio, Karen Conti. I podcast and uh, radio shows on all different legal topics. And, um, and I'd love for you to read my book. It's available on Amazon, Books a Million, Walmart. And, uh, and, and send me an email. Let me know how you like it and, and give me a good review on Amazon, which is what you're supposed to say to, to the, the public to get your book boosted up there. My email address is hello at karenconti.com, and I do like hearing from people. And even people who are, you're, you want to criticize me, I'm fine with that too. Well, it's hard to find stuff to criticize about you, Karen. You're, you're, uh, you're an amazing woman. It, it, it's just really a pleasure to meet you. And your time with us this morning has been, has been just a joy, and we look forward to talking to you again. Um, as a matter of fact, Tom and I are dedicating a good portion of our professional career now. We have a new project that we're going to be doing. It's, it's called the hunt for the real killers of Ron and Nicole, because OJ is now dead, and so we want to take up that hunt. We know he's been searching the golf courses of America, and uh, there's more work to do there. So we're going to be looking good, good actively. Good luck with that. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give it a shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I, you know, rest in peace, OJ. We we <laughs> we just having some fun. That's all. You know what, Karen? Uh, you know you you. You talked about your career and, and John Wayne Gacy, but you know what? You got to the point you're at because of your talent, because of your dedication, because of what you know. You know, yes, he pushed it and, and you took uh, the timing was right. It's all about timing, all about timing. And you grabbed it and you're very successful. And the book is, is you know, again, Killing Time with John Wayne Gacy. Get it. Uh uh, said a uh, review of it, all that stuff. And and like Dan said, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. You're so fascinating uh, because, listen, how many people get to do what you do? You know, how many people got to experience what you did? And then you take that and pass it on, you know, to maybe educate people so people can learn. Other lawyers can read it and get something out of it. You know, it's all passing on uh send it forward, all that, all that stuff. And I think that's what you're doing with, with your show, with the book, uh, is a calling and it's, and it's great. And it was such a absolute privilege to talk to you. Thank you guys. That was, it was, uh, it was really nice to meet you and I hope we, uh, stay in touch and we'll work on that OJ Simpson case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll need your advice we'll get on to that. the bottom of it. We will. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Karen Conti, thank you so much. We will look forward to hearing you on WGN um, radio. We know we can stream that online and uh, we'll be reading your book and we'll, we'll stay in touch and we'll have you back on at some point because you are an expert in so many things and it's a pleasure. And um, Tom and I like to break off. We always give it the time to break off and uh, we thank our audience for giving their, us their time today too. Yes. And once again, thank you to Karen Conti. Amazing um, interview. That was so well done and, and so informative. And like we always do, pray for our law enforcement officers, our military vets, uh, victims of crimes out there. Uh, keep them in your prayers, their families, their friends, uh, especially, you know, our, our men and women in law enforcement. Pat them on the back in the store. Give them a high five. Say thank you. See a vet in the store that might be behind you in line, buy him lunch, buy her lunch. Uh, it goes a long way, means a lot. 
So uh, like we always do, our little selfish plug, uh, youtube.com slash at Gold Shields. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell. Get notified of all our new shows. Uh, we have a bunch coming up. So stay in our Gold Shields world. And we thank everyone for their support. And once again, for a brilliant, great interview, uh, lawyer Karen Conti, my partner, Dan Murphy. This is Tom Smith for Gold Shields. Everyone stay safe. We'll see everybody soon.